I'm going to hand over to the next speaker, um, Leonard uh, Bircher, who is in Leiden University in, in Holland and is, as I said before, an astronomer. And, and I'm looking forward at his analysis of, of um, flights in the astronomy uh, society or, or community, I guess. Leo? OK, well, thank you, Jeroen, everyone. Let me share my screen. So I should see the title slide of my presentation now. Um, I guess it works, otherwise someone would complain. OK, so welcome, everyone. Um, so I, I thought um, for this talk, I'm going to um, to go a little bit beyond the, the carbon emissions, because I, when reading the program, I saw so many wonderful talks. And just hearing to Suzanne's talk, which was wonderful, I agree with it. Every part of it, um, especially long distance flights are the most complicated parts. This is all what I would also have to say. So this talk will be a little bit about sustainability, but also about other advantages of having online meetings, actually. Um, and there will be more about the actual computations of flight emissions in the talk, um, just following mine, uh, mine by uh, turn. Um, so yeah, bear with me. This is going to be a, a mix of a number of, of reasons. So following the news, of course, sustainability is the top uh, priority at the moment. The climate crisis has really hit home. Um, you've certainly all seen these images um, not far away uh, from, well, many places that from the U and I are. Uh, we have these floodings right now. Uh, there have been fire NATOs in California. I didn't even know that existed. Perhaps they didn't exist before. Um, and these can be clearly linked uh, to the climate crisis. I mean, it's always difficult for an individual event to say whether this was done due to the climate crisis. But there is this really interesting website built up by, by climate scientists called worldweatherattribution.org, where they give the probability of such an event happening um, under the, let's say, pre-industrial climate and under the current climate. And for many events, it's pretty clear that the probability has increased like fivefold or so. And then it's uh, not too difficult to, to say what this was. So urgent decarbonization is required. I uh, don't have to tell this here, really. And the question, of course, is what can we do in academia? I'll skip through these slides quickly because that has already been covered by uh, Susanne. Uh, just uh, telling you that in astronomy, you have a similar problem as apparently for the ETH. Um, flying is also um, a dramatic and, and, and uh, major part of the emissions. For example, this has been done here by the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg by a colleague of mine, Knut Janke. And they found that about half of all the emissions that they have in their institute are from flights. Um, and also uh, for, so this is mostly conferences, but also um, uh, travel to observatories as we still do uh, in astronomy to remote sites to Chile, uh, also Northern America, um, various places in the world. Um, and there has been a very good assessment also that I can invite you to read if you want. You can find it under the, this archive number um, by Clarisse Oju and colleagues on the GRAND project, which is going to be the next biggest neutrino telescope in the world. And they also looked at the travel emissions and found that travel emissions make up a significant fraction in the beginning of the telescope. And once it's installed, it's smaller and then it's mostly, mostly hardware and digital. So yeah, it depends really on the project how much the travel contributes to your total emissions. But certainly for conferences, the travel footprint is the big um, elephant in the room. Removing plastic bottles and so on is all very important, but it's really about the emissions. We did this analysis, which I think is why uh, Tern and Jeroen and others uh, have contacted me for the, um, for the European Astronomical Society annual meeting. This was published last year in Nature Astronomy and has actually caught quite some attention. Um, so that's certainly nice. I'm going to just repeat the two key facts and then as I said before, the, the detailed calculation will be presented by, uh, by Tone just after this talk. Um, so the, the big number is that for, the, for this meeting, this annual meeting, the largest annual astronomy meeting in Europe that was in Lyon in 2019, um, we estimated the total emissions from a survey and from counting people from various, uh, from all their countries and the various uh, uh, travel um, emissions, including the uh, well, extra factors like this radiative forcing for, for flights. So, so CO2 emitted in the upper atmosphere is more dramatic than emitted um, on the ground. Um, and so for 1,240 in-person attendees, this was 1.9 million kilograms of CO2, which is a lot. That's about the emissions of an institute for a whole year. Um, and then in comparison last year and also this year, actually, where we didn't do the analysis again, but uh, it was similar. Um, the, the online meeting produced a really tiny amount of something like 600 kilograms. That's as much as a single return flight within Europe compared to 
you know, almost a thousand return flights, not just within Europe, but also many long distance flights. So clearly online meetings are the advantage uh, for, for sustainability reasons, but we all know this more or less, I hope. So I wanted to go on from here a little bit and say what other advantages do online meetings have that we have come across now in the last year and a half or so as we have been meeting online most of the time. And to me, actually, the, the, the strongest um, point for why we want to do online meetings has been brought home by a wonderful talk by Sarah White, um, who works in uh, South Africa as an astronomer and has experienced all these issues about accessibility and inclusion herself uh, quite well, just, just from being in, in, in the global south. And she gave this talk, I'll have the link in the end. Um, it's, uh, you can see the slides for free on the internet at least. Um, and so what she pointed out is that, well, currently the problem we really have is if you go, or if you did go in, in the pre-corona times to any meeting, you usually see the rich folks, right? You see old people, you see some students, but mostly people from Europe, from North America, perhaps a few Australians, but you rarely see people from other parts of the world. And that's not because they're not interested in research, but they just cannot afford it. And so that is the reality, right? The equality is we, we give some support to, to everyone, but it's not enough for those who, who still can't make it there because they might uh, not be able to, for example, get a visa or um, get the required vaccinations or whatever other things that are required to travel. The next uh, best solution then would be equity. So we give everyone the support they actually need in order to watch the game, of course, here as an image for watch the, the online conference. But the best thing really, of course, obviously, is to just remove the board or the, the, the barrier. Uh, and this would be justice to, to actually give, every, give everyone what they need without begging for it, so to say. And with online meetings, we're nearly there. I mean, of course, internet access isn't the same everywhere in the world, but it is already uh, pretty good. And actually, we had participants from, for example, uh, many different Afri African countries and also um, Asian countries at this European Astronomical Society meeting um, because they could just join online for a relatively small fee. And there, there's more reasons why online conferences are adv advantageous compared to uh, real life meetings. There's accessibility um, arguments. Uh, for example, online meetings can very easily provide closed captioning. There's tools now that use artificial intelligence to translate what someone says into text. Um, everyone has a close-up view of the presentation. You, you don't have to, if you're coming late and, and you don't see the, the slide or something, that's an issue of the past. We have no worries about wheelchair access. Everyone has their, uh, their home facilities, which are catered to what they need. And finally, there's also the issue about neurodiversity. Right? Some people are very outspoken, are very outgoing, extroverted. Others prefer not to meet with too many people and find it not so nice, actually, at, in big conferences where they have to talk with so many people. So for them in particular, it, it is seen much easier to just interact online via Slack or some other um, chat tools. And um, also, of course, it has to be kept in mind that um, solutions, accessibility solutions, um, are not just a solution for, for permanent disabled people, but they are actually a solution for many uh, people. For example, for parents, uh, for, for people who, who might not hear as well in the current situation, um, or also for people who have perhaps a very strong accent or just aren't um, native speakers in, in English, like myself. Um, there, is, there are many reasons why people cannot access in-person meetings, right? We have, uh, as we already, as I already mentioned, there's the small travel funds problem for people who particularly come from the global south. There are caring responsibilities. Uh, I have myself three small children, and I'm quite happy that the last year and a half, I've actually seen them almost every day. Whereas before I used to go away a week or so per month almost to various meetings and conferences and observing runs and, and was away from, from family for quite some time, which put quite some strain also on the working schedule of my wife. Um, there is uh, mobility problems, of course. Some people may just not be able to, to move around as easily as, as able people do. Um, teaching duties are, of course, a common issue in, in the university. Um, social anxiety, so that's the, the neurodiversity uh, issue, the wrong passport, so some people, um, especially again from Global South, but also, for example, from India, have extreme difficulties just going for a conference to the US. Um, and uh, that is an obstacle that is not really required these days. Um, tight schedules, of course, all of us have a lot of things to do, medical treatments, and, and, and. There's really lots of reasons why people may not be able to join an in-person meeting, and these all go away with online meetings. 
Another advantage of online meetings is the legacy value. We've seen in many online meetings now that if they're organized uh, in a way to make use of all the various uh, tools that we have, um, for example, this is for a conference that, that I co-organized last year, um, we used uh, YouTube to uh, stream all the recordings within just a few hours um, to everyone. So even people who joined from, let's say, US West Coast or from Japan were able to follow the talks almost in real time in their own time zone without chat lag and then discuss with everyone via Slack. Uh, this is a, a discussion platform. And finally, we um, put all the, the talks, uh, all the presentations on Zenodo, which is not something that would not be possible in real person meetings, but I haven't seen it done so commonly as for online meetings. So there's a, a huge legacy value to online meetings that I haven't seen so much for, for in-person meetings. And finally, um, efficiency and safety are also big issues, right? We have, uh, we're really actually too busy to, to chat around the world just to meet, to, meet each other. Um, we can also do this uh, via Zoom. Jet lag doesn't have to be an issue if we organize online conferences in the right way. Infections are an issue, especially if you go to the US and you're in one of these super air-conditioned conference centers, you might get, if not Corona, some other uh, uh, virus that is certainly not nice to get. Food poisoning happens perhaps to everyone who has, is at a big meeting and eats from a big buffet where you know, things stand around perhaps a bit longer than they should be, usually not a problem at home. <laughs> and finally, social safety. We've had essentially no reports about uh, code of conduct violations at our European Astronomical Society meetings, but this has happened before, I wouldn't say regularly, but it has happened before at least a few incidences per meeting. Um, <clears throat> Right, so this brings me to the point, why then do some of us want to go back to normal meetings or to, to, to the, the old normal if the new normal, the online meetings are so much better? And the only argument that you usually hear about this is networking. I mean, there's also the other argument that I really love to go to, you know, fancy places, uh, ski slopes and, and beaches. But let's, let's put this aside because I think we agree that this is not an argument that is... Um, not a sincere argument, let's say. But networking is the one that is always put up front because networking, <coughs> they say, <coughs> apologies, um, is only really possible in, an, uh, in a real life meeting. Well, I agree that having a beer or a coffee with friends is a really nice thing to have, but um, we have to be careful here to not mix our personal desires and our personal wishes with what is really required to do our research. And especially, as again, uh, Sarah White, uh, the researcher from South Africa put it, we say, it's a pleasure to meet you, but my pleasure or your pleasure doesn't go about, above the pain of someone else who cannot join the meeting. So we need to be really careful here about what we prioritize. And then it's important to keep in mind that yes, networking is still a bit difficulty in online meetings. We have uh, various tools that are being tried out like Gather Town, virtual reality goggles, all sorts of things that will perhaps at some point come, but at the moment there is indeed clearly still uh, room for improvement there. But let's keep in mind that we really just began uh, with, with online meetings, big online meetings a year and a half ago, and uh, the, the development is certainly not over. Uh, online meeting platforms are getting better and better every day. And we, we could also keep in mind that the first uh, TV shows that were, were recorded were actually recorded radio shows because they didn't know how to do TV shows at the time. And so there's clearly a path for improvement here. And uh, in a couple of years, if we continue with the online meetings, I'm convinced that they will be much better and much more suitable for the online format than they are now, where they are essentially copied in-person meetings and just put online. Last but not least, um, I'd like to mention, because uh, I think um, Jeroen mentioned in the beginning that he saw astronomers were so active in this. So I'm an astronomer myself and indeed, this whole um, business starting, I mean, this all started thinking about sustainability. And we, we were wondering as astronomers, what can we do to fight against the climate crisis, which we, we all, we experience it now. We, we've actually felt the heat wave that struck Southern France in June, 2019, when there was this European Astronomical Society meeting that was our starting point for the activity. And we thought, okay, we are contributing to this. And I fully support also what Suzanne said before, that we need to reduce our own emissions to become credible to then say, look, this is really a serious problem. We really need to act and we need to act now. And so I think actually the second part of, of communicating this, this crisis and communicating the, the urgency 
is even more important than reducing our own emissions in the long term. But the redu but reducing the emissions is kind of the required uh, prerequisite in order to to become credible. And just a few storylines that we use in astronomy, of course, to to share the message how important it is to uh, to take good care of our Earth is. I mean, there is the statement of there is no planet D, which you see at many climate rallies, and it's true. We've, we've found all, over 4,000 exoplanets uh, to date in astronomy uh, through astronomical research. None of them is like the Earth, and even if there was one like Earth, we couldn't go there. So there is really no planet that we could go to except our own planet, and it's very, very lost and alone in the universe, so to say. But in addition, uh, as scientists, we can communicate about facts and methods. This is not always the most efficient thing to do, because people who don't trust climate scientists or who don't believe in anthropogenic climate change don't usually need more facts they need more they need to be um, they need to find a storyline that fits with their own beliefs so for them it might be more useful to talk with them um, to talk to them about their own heimat you know their own uh, protection of their own land and, and how important it is there are sometimes difficult um, communications to be had but this is certainly one aspect that can be shared from scientists we can share perspective as astronomers. We can show that there is really only this one Earth. There are no boundaries. There's no nations. There's just one planet, and we're all on it. And we're like a spaceship in, in space that uh, we need to share our resources and be careful about what we use. And uh, last but not least, we have this wonderful, more perspective image um, of a pale blue dot that many of you probably have seen before. And if not, it's one of the most fascinating images that uh, space science has produced. Here, this little dot, this is us, this is the Earth. Uh, Carl Sagan, who took this image, said the only home we ever had. Um, and this shows really quite impressively how small the Earth is in the universe and, and that this is really the only spot we have. So it's really uh, just us. Okay, with this, uh, I'll stop at 16 minutes after the beginning and just share some references with you. If you want, you can also have the slides later. Um, and thank you for your attention. And of course, happy to take any questions. Super, thanks, Leo, for for this very true or very detailed analysis of how how we're organizing meetings in the past. So I hope we can change uh, and and take lessons from from your analysis. So one of the questions in the chat or in the Q and A already from Melissa is um, uh, these kind of methods from organizing online meetings was suggested to COP organizers, and they had the the comment was, or the argument of having it live, was that that actually the way around does indige indigenous representatives must be heard directly. So more or less the, the opposite um, argument that you made that it's much easier for people that now have difficulties to come and participate in in these online meetings that they should be invited live. And and so, what's your comment on that? I'm not sure, I fully understand the question. I mean. Is the, it's a, the, the, so the COP is the, the, the climate conference, right, which will yeah. happen in Glasgow in, I guess, somewhere in October, November. Yes. And mm -hmm. they actually were contacted and they said that the way around that it's imp important to invite people to, to incorporate them in the discussion. But I guess. OK, I see. So, I mean, that, that of course, opens the, the issue of hybrid meetings. I mean, the COP will take place as a real meeting in Glasgow, as you say, and having some people there in person and others by video is a problem with that i would agree um because then you it's almost unavoidable to then create two classes of participants those who are there in person are the first class participants somehow and those who only join the video will get to see less of the conference will get to make fewer contacts and and they will also be perhaps less convincing than those who are there in real life so that that issue i would uh, i would agree on um i think the the problem is that we need to move away from, from these in-person meetings uh, in the first place, in, in my view at least, and should just go to online meetings. And then everyone has the same footing. And then it's actually much easier to include voices who are directly affected and not just at a top level international meeting like the COP, but even in a small league meeting like this one. You know, we could have someone from Uganda who tells us about how difficult it is and how he or she has never been at the science meeting in Europe, but how they might be able to join online meetings three times a year now. Right? So I think there's many more opportunities in online meetings than there are disadvantages.
Yes, I agree. And and just before we hand over to turn to the next speaker, is is so what's your why are the astro astronomers so so are they detail more detailed in their analysis or why did they take it up? I I, I mean I can see uh, you're looking more at pictures from planet Earth and and seeing the necessity, but I I still find it quite fascinating because you're actually I mean compared to all scientists, it's quite a small field, I guess, but but still. Uh, it's a small field, yes. I <laughs> I don't know. I mean I'm. Uh... I, I, I see it as a compliment for astronomers that we're apparently more active here. Um, I would hope that certainly climate scientists should be even more active than we are because they are on, on the forefront. I mean, perhaps it helps to to see the Earth from from some perspective and um, try to share that point as well. But I think actually every scientist, I mean, can share this this point of view, right? I mean, climate uh, the climate crisis will affect every part of life, and so every science. And every scientist uh, should also speak up about it.